This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. Good morning, I'm John Trout. It's Thursday, April 4th, 2024. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. Developments in Donald Trump's legal trials. He says all records are presidential. I'm John Stolness. Texas contends its controversial immigration law may have limitations, but it's all up to a federal appeals court. I'm Clayton Neville. We'll have the latest on the massive earthquake in Taiwan. A man who used a megaphone to lead the attack on police during the Capitol riot gets more than seven years in prison. Ed Donahue, Washington. On Wall Street, stocks are coming off a mixed day, but the Dow is on a three-day losing streak. I'm Jessica Ettinger. Wicked weather leaves many in the dark. We'll have details with correspondent Donna Warder and shelling out big bucks for women's hoops. All ahead on America in the Morning. The special prosecutor in the Trump classified document scandal is growing increasingly frustrated with the judge handling the case, offering a sharp rebuke in a legal filing. This as developments in the other Trump trials are still unfolding. John Stolness has the latest. In the papers filed by special counsel Jack Smith, he takes aim at what he calls a, quote, fundamentally flawed legal decision by Judge Eileen Cannon, asking lawyers to respond to two different interpretations of the Presidential Records Act of 1978, which instructs presidents to return all records from when they were in office over to the government except for personal documents. Trump's team claims any documents found at Mar-a-Lago were claimed by Trump to be personal documents. And Judge Cannon seems willing to allow jurors to hear about this law as a possible reason for Trump keeping the classified documents. Smith says the act has no bearing on this case, that Trump invented the personal paper story after the documents were found, and that instructing jurors it does have relevance would, quote, distort the trial. He also urged Judge Cannon to rule on his filing as soon as possible so they can appeal to a higher court if she rules against him. Former acting attorney general Matt Whitaker telling Fox News, Cannon seems to agree with the Trump legal team. The Presidential Records Act, Brian, it says all documents. It doesn't carve out defense intelligence information. It doesn't carve out classified marked information. It says all records are presidential and then it has a process. And that's what Judge Cannon is trying to get get to the bottom of. And that's what Jack Smith, uh, to your point, is really objecting to. Trump appointed Cannon to the bench while he was in office. Prosecutors have been highly critical of her handling of the case and her delay in naming a start date to the trial, hinting that she's dragging the proceeding out to benefit Trump. Meanwhile, Judge Juan Mershon has rejected a bid by the former president to further delay his hush money trial. Trump's lawyers ask for the delay until the Supreme Court rules on his claims of presidential immunity. But Judge Mershon said the request was not made in a timely manner and that it, quote, raises real questions about the sincerity and actual purpose of the motion. Trump's lawyers are pushing for Mershon to recuse himself from the case again. In a letter, they argued Mershon's daughter's work for a digital consulting firm creates a conflict of interest for Mershon. Mershon was also asked to recuse himself last year. He refused. The hush money trial is still slated to start on April 15th. I'm John Stolness. The controversial immigration law in Texas known as SB4 remains on hold as attorneys for the Lone Star State argues its case to a federal appeals court. Correspondent Clayton Neville has the latest. The U.S. Supreme Court kicked Texas's Senate Bill 4 back to the lower courts earlier this year. And this week, Texas made arguments in front of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. U.S. Department of Justice Attorney Daniel Tinney contends that immigration is a federal issue and isn't up to the states. Nothing that has happened this morning provides any basis for deviating from the analysis set out in this court's stay opinion. Texas claims it has a constitutional right to protect its border from an invasion and argues it's it's doing what the Biden administration refuses to do. The law lets Texas law enforcement arrest anyone suspected of being in the country illegally. Critics say it'll lead to racial profiling. What Texas has done here is they have looked at the Supreme Court's precedent and they have tried to develop a statute that goes up to the line of Supreme Court precedent but allows Texas to protect the border. Texas Solicitor General Aaron Nielsen argued in front of the three-judge panel. Now, to be fair, maybe Texas went too far, and that's the question this court's going to have to decide. But that's the context of which we are here. Texas has looked at the Supreme Court precedent 
uh, and the laws that Congress has enacted and has tried to develop a law that goes up to the edge, but no further. Nielsen acknowledged potential limitations with the law. Texas would take the person to the port of entry. Uh, presumably, the United States would then put them into the United States system. They would process them, and then they would give them a hearing date of some sort. Texas, under the position of the attorney general, would not be able to prosecute that person again. The appeals court considering the law while Texas takes other measures to deter illegal immigration, like laying razor wire and putting up fencing. The Fifth Circuit's decision expected to eventually make its way back to the high court. I'm Clayton Neville. When we return on America in the Morning, federal judge cracks down on Capitol rioter after these messages. This is America in the Morning. AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy has been tracking a storm pretty much all week that's been moving across the country. Here's today's update. The storm that brought severe thunderstorms to a large swath of the plains and eastward to the east coast, as well as snow from Minnesota through the Great Lakes and into the northeast, will still have wide-reaching effects today, with moderate to heavy snow continuing in northern New England and some heavier rain to start the day through coastal New England. Some snow in the northern mountains could reach as high as 18 inches. Additionally, there will be an expansive area of showers mixed with some snow through the Great Lakes, southward through the Ohio Valley, and into eastern Tennessee. Into the Middle Atlantic, there could also be a few rumbles of thunder in parts of Virginia into Delaware. It will even be cold enough for a light, steady snow to develop in the central Appalachians, mostly around West Virginia. Outside of the showers, it is going to be a breezy, chilly day throughout the region, with highs largely in the 30s and 40s, with a few 50-degree readings into the Middle Atlantic. The southeast will have a nice day with sunshine returning, though we'll still be on the cooler side of average with highs in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Another very large storm has entered the west with its impacts widespread across the west coast states into the northern Rockies and then southward to Nevada. There will still be some showers and even some thunderstorms with a steadier rain increasing across the Sierra Nevada before it turns cold enough to turn to snow tonight. Snow will expand into Nevada and the northern Rockies as well with several inches possible by tomorrow morning. That's the weather across America. It'll be a breezy, cold day in Grand Rapids, Michigan, with a mixture of rain and snow showers and a high of 44. McAllen, Texas will conversely have a warm day with sunshine and a high of 91. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. Remember, you can follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. The strongest earthquake to hit Taiwan in over 25 years has now left 1,000 injured, and rescue efforts to free and find dozens of trapped people is still underway. Correspondent Charles de Ledesma provides this update. Taiwan says the earthquake has killed around nine people and stranded around 70 workers in two rock quarries. The authorities add contact has been lost with dozens of people in minibuses after the quake downed phone networks. The director general of the Red Cross in Taiwan, Larry Ning Pao Kao, recounts the moment he felt the quake. My office is located in New Taipei City, but we still can feel the strength of the quake. So, yes. It's very strong. Television images have shown neighbors and rescue workers lifting residents, including a toddler, through windows and onto the street. William Lai, Taiwan vice president, tells the media the most important thing right now is to rescue people. I'm Charles Tulatesma. A federal judge blasts a convicted January 6th rioter for downplaying the U.S. Capitol attack during his trial. Ed Donahue reports that the defendant called those convicted of crimes during the riot at the Capitol hostages and that he'd soon join those in a place he called a gulag. Judge Royce Lambert says video shows Taylor Jonatakis from Washington State barking commands over his megaphone, giving step-by-step -step directions for overpowering officers. He said in any angry mob, there are leaders and followers, and Jonatakis was a leader. The self-employed installer of septic systems represented himself at trial. The judge referred to some of John Atakis' words as gobbledygook. Several hours after he left the Capitol January 6th, John Atakis posted on social media, the crime is complete. Ed Donahue, Washington. Increasing your pay at work. 
when America in the Morning continues after these messages. The Business Report is sponsored by Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments has a team of specialists in investing, financial planning, estate planning, and more. Learn more at fisherinvestments.com. With a check of markets and more, here's CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. Wall Street opens this morning after a volatile day for the major averages yesterday. The Dow was down, then up, then down again. It did finish lower for a third straight day. Modest gains for the S&P 500 index and the NASDAQ, however. It's been a wobbly start to the second quarter. Everyone, by acknowledgement, says, look, this is an overbought market. You almost never go much more than five months without having a proper pullback. CNBC's Mike Santoli. Disney won its proxy fight with activist investor Nelson Peltz. Shareholders re-elected the full Disney board in a stamp of approval for CEO Bob Iger and what he's doing to turn around the company. The shareholders won. I mean, you couldn't have picked a better central casting villain versus, um, you know, CEO with Bob Iger, very measured and always calm and, and presentable. And Nelson, you know, kind of throwing darts. But the fact is the stock's up 35 percent year to date, as many have pointed out. Laffer Tangler's Nancy Tangler on CNBC. More record highs for gold as investors watch geopolitical flare-ups around the world. Gold prices, COMEX gold, we had 23.16 earlier in the session, so we'll put a star right up here, another record high. This is going to be the seventh straight day worth of gains for COMEX gold. So again, watch those precious metals. It seems to be that big momentum trade. CNBC's Dominic Chu. The owner of the New York Mets tells CNBC his investment in PGA Tour golf is a bet on... Lots of people having more leisure time. My belief is a four-day work week is coming. You know, just between the advent of AI, we hear from people that Fridays are just not, uh, people are not as productive on Fridays. And so I just think it's an eventuality. When it happens, hard to know. But that should fit into a theme of more leisure for people. Uh, which means golf rounds will go up. Point seventy two hedge fund chairman Steve Cohen on CNBC. Amazon cutting hundreds of jobs in its cloud computing unit. Sales growth at Amazon Web Services has slowed in recent quarters. Ulta Beauty shares fell. The CEO's warning, demand for beauty products. Okay, Jessica, I'm told you have the strategy for making more money at work. Find a better paying job. <laughs> I asked. Seriously, strong private sector job creation numbers from ADP for March, strong pay increases last month, but the report found the real money is when you change jobs. You see that the job stayers, 5.1% wage growth, but job changers, that's the big number, up 10%, which was a big jump from wow. the prior quarter. So it seems like employers are paying up to get workers to move. CNBC senior economics reporter Steve Leesman. On today's watch list, we get earnings from ConAgra. National Burrito Day is today. Plenty of deals and discounts at different chains around the U.S. All right, CNBC's Jessica Edinger. When we return on America in the Morning, college sports new hot tickets after these messages. Welcome back. You're with America in the Morning. Up to three feet of snow in New England, 16 tornadoes touching down in six states, and a deluge of rain and flooding has left tens of thousands of homes without electricity after powerful storms roared through a number of states. Correspondent Donna Warder has the update. In Louisville, Kentucky, Mayor Craig Greenberg said in a news conference carried by WHAS that he's declaring a state of emergency for Jefferson County. There is definitely significant damage to homes. There's significant damage to fences, to trees. The storms prompted tornado watches overnight in parts of Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia, and West Virginia, where in Dunbar, Ronnie Howard told WCHS he was at work when Tuesday's storm blew over a huge billboard that landed on top of his car. Employees run in and say, Ron, Ron, it's your car, your car. I think they're playing a joke on me. About 
about 140,000 homes and businesses in West Virginia initially lost power. In Wisconsin, more than 70,000. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, a 46-year-old homeless woman who was sleeping at the entrance of a drainage pipe was killed. I'm Donna Water. Today's batch of potentially severe weather includes snow in New England states and high wind warnings in the desert southwest. Hot hoops in college sports, women's NCAA semifinals tickets are more than twice as much as those of their male counterparts. Lisa Dwyer has the story. According to a technology company that analyzes prices across multiple platforms, the average price of a ticket sold to the men's semifinals was about $1,000. Tickets for the women's semifinals was more than double that at just over $2,300. The higher price for the women's games is partially due to the fact that the venues for men's games are about three times larger than the women's games, which have limited seating capacity. But there's no doubt that the fanfare surrounding Iowa's Caitlin Clark, who is now the all-time leading scorer in Division I, has added to the bump in those prices as well. I'm Lisa Dwyer. America in the Morning for Thursday, April 4th, 2024 is produced by Jeff McKay. Senior producer, Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. Coming up this half hour, U.S. demands investigation into aid workers' deaths in Gaza. Then, a report on questioning warnings given to the workers who died in the Baltimore Bridge collapse. The head of the Federal Reserve says he still expects interest rate cuts this year. I'm Ed Donahue. More information on the man believed to be responsible for ramming an SUV into an FBI gate. I'm Clayton Neville. Filling the RNC's campaign coffers, the latest polling on the presidential race, and the largest cash theft in Los Angeles history. Thousands of people worldwide left without their favorite social media apps on Wednesday. I'm Pamela Furr. Back after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy is tracking the next major storm system. A very large storm has moved into the west with its impacts widespread across the west coast states into the northern Rockies and southward to Nevada. There will be several areas with showers and even some thunderstorms. And a steadier rain will develop over the Sierra Nevada before turning cold enough to go over to snow tonight. Snow will also expand into Nevada and the northern Rockies with several inches possible by tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the storm that brought several severe thunderstorms to the plains into the east coast and snow from Minnesota through the Great Lakes and northeast will still have wide-reaching effects today with a moderate to heavy snow continuing in northern New England and some heavier rain to start the day through coastal New England. Some of the snow in the northern mountains of northern New England could reach as high as 18 inches. Additionally, there will be continuing a wide area of showers mixed with some snow through the Great Lakes southward to the Ohio Valley into eastern Tennessee as well as the Mid-Atlantic. There could also be a few rumbles of thunder in parts of Virginia into Delaware. It will even be cold enough for a light, steady snow in the central Appalachians, mostly centered around West Virginia. Outside of the showers, it is going to be a breezy, chilly day throughout the region with highs largely in the 30s and 40s. A few 50 degree readings will develop in the middle Atlantic. In the southeast, it'll be a nicer day with sunshine returning, though it's still going to be on the cooler side of the historical average with highs in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The weather in between these two very large systems is going to be a sharp contrast with many places having abundant sunshine and afternoon temperatures soaring well above the historical average by as much as 20 degrees in some northern plain states with highs in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. Remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu are scheduled to speak. As Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports, the U.S. is pushing Israel for a more comprehensive probe of the deadly attack on aid workers in Gaza following a preliminary investigation being conducted by the Israeli Defense Force. 
Israel has announced the results of a preliminary probe into the killings of six World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza. Israel's military chief says the airstrikes were a mistake following a misidentification at night during a war in complex conditions. The strike was not carried out with the intention of harming WCK aid workers. It was a mistake that followed a misidentification. We will continue taking immediate actions to ensure that more is done to protect humanitarian aid workers. Chef Jose Andres, who founded the charity, says these were not just unfortunate mistakes in the fog of war. In an op-ed published in an Israeli paper, Andres says it was a direct attack on clearly marked vehicles. We expect the Israelis to conduct a thorough, comprehensive, complete and transparent investigation. We look forward to finding out the results of that investigation. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll move on from there. President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu are set to speak amid growing White House frustration with Israel's handling of the Gaza war. A U.S. official says the call will come Thursday after an Israeli airstrike that killed seven aid workers. He's outraged. He's heartbroken. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre and National Security Spokesman John Kirby say while Israel has the right to defend itself against Hamas. As a modern military and a democracy, They have obligations to the innocent people of Gaza, and they have not always met those obligations. The two leaders last spoke more than two weeks ago. Sagar Magani, Washington. Crews open a second temporary channel to allow ships to regain access to the Port of Baltimore. And there are serious questions remaining as to whether the construction company whose workers died in the key bridge collapse took proper safety precautions. Correspondent Donna Warder reports. I need one of you guys on the south side, one of you guys on the north side, hold all traffic on the key bridge. Uh, there's a ship approaching that just lost their steering. So they tell you that under control, we gotta stop all traffic. Yeah, we're all on the route to the south side. Uh, I'm holding traffic now. I was dragging, but we stopped prior to the bridge. So I'll have all out. Before a cargo ship rammed into Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge last week, a flurry of urgent warnings were heard over radios, like this one on Broadcastify, enabling police to stop traffic from getting on the span. Just make sure no one's on the bridge right now. But the warnings seemingly didn't reach the six construction workers who were killed. Uh, There's a crew out there. You might want to notify whoever the foreman is, see if we can get them off the bridge temporarily. Their deaths are raising questions about whether the construction company they worked for took proper precautions, including keeping a safety boat nearby, which might have been able to warn the workers about the approaching cargo ship. C-13 dispatch, the whole bridge just fell down. Start. Started, whoever, everybody, the whole bridge just collapsed. Safety experts say federal regulations require construction companies to keep such boats nearby. But there was no such indication that the company, Bronner Builders, had a rescue boat on the water. I'm Donna Water. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell says although they are planning for multiple interest rate cuts this year, more evidence that inflation is under control is needed before those measures can begin. Correspondent Ed Donahue reports. Recent readings on both job gains and inflation have come in higher than expected. The economy added in an, av- an average of 265,000 jobs per month uh, in the three years through February, a faster pace than we have seen since last June. Speaking at Stanford University, Fed Chair Jerome Powell did not sound too concerned about higher inflation numbers to start the year. These recent data do not, however, materially change the overall picture which continues to be one of solid growth, a strong but rebalancing labor market, and inflation moving down toward 2% on a sometimes bumpy path. Powell says most Fed officials see it as likely to be appropriate to start cutting their key rate at some point this year. We're going to do what the right thing is for the economy over time, and my colleagues and I are tightly focused on that. Powell sought to dispel any notion the Fed's interest rate decisions might be affected by the presidential campaign. My colleagues and I continue to believe that The policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as we expect, most FOMC participants see it as likely 
to be appropriate to begin lowering the policy rate at some point this year. Meetings will be held and decisions will be made whether to cut rates during the peak of the campaign in July and September. I don't think late rates will go back to the very historically low right. levels that they were at before the pandemic hit. I do think uh, rates will come down from or likely to be lower than they are. At least short term rates are lower than they were right right now. I'm Ed Donahue. Among the stories we're covering next, Georgia election law kerfuffle and Kansas City at risk of losing its professional sports teams. Those stories and more when America in the Morning continues after these messages. I'm John Trout. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. We're learning more about the suspect accused of ramming a vehicle into a gate outside the FBI office in Atlanta. Researching those details, correspondent Clayton Neville. The suspect is facing serious charges. Both state and federal charges. Pete Ellis with the FBI says that on Monday, the man tried to get through the gate at the FBI Atlanta office, but couldn't. He tried to follow in and tried getting into the gate, but our Security uh, precautions prevented him from getting in. The man who we now know as a U.S. veteran from South Carolina was quickly apprehended by nearby agents and was taken to a hospital to be medically evaluated. The FBI investigating its protocol. Absolutely. Any type of situation like this, we always go and we do like a hot wash. We, we go sit down and we talk about the situation. Absolutely. But the pop-up barrier at the gate served its purpose, stopping the SUV from getting any further. As far as a motive in the case, that's still under investigation. I'm Clayton Neville. Lawmakers in Georgia are once again tinkering with state election laws, this time over voter eligibility. Correspondent Jennifer King reports. The ACLU has already threatened to sue over Georgia Senate Bill 189, passed by Republican lawmakers, that would make it easier to challenge voter rolls and have people removed. Supporters say the changes will weed out voter fraud and that the current process takes too long. Opponents argue the law targets younger, poorer voters and could put legitimate voters through a legal ringer. A Texas-based group, True the Vote, and others have challenged hundreds of thousands of voters since 2021. The bill bans the use of rented P.O. boxes as a voting address and defines evidence for probable cause, such as registering to another jurisdiction or tax exemptions that point to an alternate address. It says that the national change of address list can be considered, but not as sole proof. Representative Syra Draper, a Democrat, says she can't believe Georgia is, quote, bending over to accommodate election deniers, conspiracy theorists, and unindicted co-conspirators. I'm Jennifer King. In the battle of the campaign coffers, Donald Trump and the Republican Party say they raised more than $65 million in March. Lisa Dwyer has more on the story. Donald Trump and the Republican National Committee closed out the month of March with $93.1 million in their campaign accounts. That's a significant increase as they try to catch up to the fundraising of President Joe Biden and the Democrats. Biden and the Democratic National Committee have not yet released their fundraising numbers for March, but their political operation says they brought in $53 million in February and closed out that month with $155 million cash on hand. Biden has been fundraising jointly with his party since he launched his re-election campaign, while Trump first had to clear a field of challengers. I'm Lisa Dwyer. The Democrat and Republican national conventions are still months away, but polling showing a very close race that has Donald Trump slightly ahead. A Wall Street Journal survey finds the former president with an edge over President Biden in six of seven key battleground states. But nearly all are within the margin of error, except for North Carolina, where Trump holds a six-point advantage, and Arizona, where he has a five-point lead. Trump's got a slight lead among independent voters as well when it comes to specific issues. Voters trust Trump to better handle the economy and immigration while Biden is the preferred candidate when it comes to abortion. More than half the voters polled say that both Biden and Trump are not physically fit to serve another four years. A failed ballot measure in Kansas City has clouded the future of the city's top two professional sports teams. Correspondent Gethin Coolball has the story. 
The future of the Chiefs and Royals in Kansas City is in doubt. After the decisive failure of a ballot measure that would have provided public funds for a downtown ballpark in Kansas City and renovations to Arrowhead Stadium. The Royals wanted the passage of a three-eighths of a cent sales tax to help fund a $1 billion plus stadium, which would have served as the centerpiece of a $2 billion ballpark district. The Chiefs wanted to use their share of tax money to help pay for an $800 million renovation to Arrowhead Stadium. Now the clubs are left to explore their options, which could include leaving Kansas City. I'm Geffen Kuhlbach. Communications were down for many in the U.S. and around the world when three meta-owned social media apps suddenly stopped working Wednesday afternoon. Filling in for Chuck Palm, here's Pamela Furr with today's tech report. Instagram, Facebook, and WhatsApp were all offline as a spokesperson for Meta Platforms, Inc., reported major disruptions in its ads transparency tools behind the outages. That didn't help the many users who took to Elon Musk's X to complain about the problems. Users of Facebook's desktop client in the Dallas and Houston areas seemed to be the hardest hit, with the majority of the WhatsApp and Instagram complaints were about the mobile app versions. Now, Wednesday's technical problems followed a similar widespread outage around a month ago with no real explanation of what happened then. Meta has about 3.19 billion daily active users across its family of apps. I'm Pamela Furr. America in the Morning continues as we gear up for a big weekend in college hoops. Robert Workman is in with a check of sports. Two days after throwing the season's first no-hitter, the Astros nearly did it again. Christian Javier and four relievers held the Blue Jays to one hit, a second-inning double by Dalton Varsho in an 8 nothing romp. Jordan Alvarez hit two of Houston's four homers on the night. Guardians blanked the Mariners 8 nothing. Logan Allen and company with a five-hitter. Red Sox shut out the A's 1-0. Nick Pavetta and the Knacks scattered eight hits. Defense did tremendous behind me today, making lots of plays, uh, good double plays. Took a team effort today, and it was a good team effort win. Dodgers edge the Giants, Shohei Otani's first Dodger dinger turned out to be the difference. Aaron Judge hit his first homer of the season and doubled in a run in the 11th to help the Yankees to a one-run win over the Diamondbacks. Cubs blew a six-run lead, but Seiya Suzuki's fourth RBI of the night got them past the Rockies. Orioles got a walk-off two-run single from James McCann to trim the Royals. Reds ripped the Phillies, Rangers deflected the Rays, Padres shaded the Cardinals. Nationals handed the Pirates their first loss. Twins knocked the Brewers from the ranks of the unbeaten. Angels manhandled the Marlins. Miami now 0-7. Tigers and Mets were were rained out again. They'll try and squeeze in a pair today. Detroit, the last unbeaten team standing. New York still looking for its first W. NBA, the Celtics rolled over the Thunder. Win number 60 clinches home court advantage throughout the playoffs. Timberwolves trounced the Raptors to tie the Nuggets for first place in the West. Toronto has now lost 15 in a row. Blazers buzzed the Hornets to snap a 10-game skid. Lakers got by the Wizards for their eighth win in nine games. 40 for Devin Booker as the Suns burn the Cavaliers. Phoenix now owns the tiebreaker over New Orleans for the sixth seed in the West with six games to play. Hawks clinch a play-in berth in the East with a win over the Pistons despite 50 from Malachi Flynn for Detroit. NHL, the Rangers got by the Devils. New York leads the league with 106 points. Stars lead the West with 105 after a shellacking of the Oilers. Eight straight wins for Dallas, a new franchise record. That's Thursday Sports. Thank you, sir. When we return on America in the Morning, the comedy special no one's laughing about and how tens of millions of dollars came up missing after these messages. America in the Morning is back. Another famous movie franchise is heading to its fifth reboot. Kevin Carr has details. In true Hollywood fashion, where everything old is new again, Warner Brothers has announced the development of a fifth Matrix film. I'm sure you can understand why our beloved parent company, Warner Brothers, has decided to make a sequel to the trilogy. This is the latest in a string of completed franchises Warner Brothers has been rebooting. Some of these include an upcoming Harry Potter show, Game of Thrones spinoffs, and a series on Max based on Stephen King's It. After all these years, to be going back to where it all started, Back to the Matrix. This will be the first Matrix film not directed by the Wachowskis. Instead, Drew Goddard, who wrote the screenplays for films like Ridley Scott's The Martian, Cabin in the Woods, and World War Z, will write and direct. 
Lana Wachowski, who co-directed the trilogy and directed the previous film, will serve as executive producer. No one has ever done anything like this. That's why it's going to work. According to a statement from Warner Brothers, Goddard approached the studio with a new idea to continue the franchise. However, no plot details or casting information has been announced. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. While the original Matrix trilogy was a huge hit, the last film, Matrix Resurrections, flopped. Even taken into account it came out during COVID as a hybrid streaming release, the $157 million it made worldwide didn't come close to earning back its $190 million budget. Whoa. I'm Kevin Carr. Nothing to laugh at. Perhaps for the losing side, a legal settlement has been reached over a fake George Carlin comedy special. Correspondent Margie Zaraleta explains. An hour-long comedy special by podcast company Dudesy, posted on YouTube in January, included a voiceover identifying itself as an artificial intelligence engine, saying it analyzed 50 years of George Carlin's material to imitate his voice and comment on current events. Carlin's estate sued two weeks later. The settlement calls for Dudesy to take down the special permanently and refrain from using Carlin's voice or likeness without permission. Dudesy representatives could not be reached for comment. Carlin's daughter, Kelly Carlin, says the case serves as a warning about the dangers of AI and why safeguards are needed. I'm Archie Zaraleta. It's being called one of the largest cash heists in Los Angeles history, and it took more than a day for anyone to notice. Correspondent Haya Panjwani reports that police are trying to figure out how thieves were able to get into a secured money storage facility, break into a safe, and somehow escape with as much as $30 million. Police say the heist on Easter Sunday is one of the largest cash heists in Los Angeles history. The burglary occurred in the Silmar area of San Fernando Valley, where cash from businesses across the region is handled and stored. Thieves stole as much as $30 million from a Los Angeles money storage facility. Burglars breached the unidentified building and safe where the money was stored, and the business's operators did not discover the massive theft until they opened the vault on Monday. The Los Angeles Times reported that the total amount stolen also surpassed any armored car heist in the city. I'm Maya Panjwani. America in the Morning for Thursday, April 4th, 2024 is produced by Jeff McKay, Senior Producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One.